The modern evolutionary synthesis is a 20th century synthesis of ideas from several fields of biology that provides an account of evolution which is widely accepted. The synthesis, produced between 1936 and 1947, reflects the consensus about how evolution proceeds. The previous development of 19th-century evolutionary ideas by Charles Darwin, Gregor Mendel and others and the population genetics, between 1918 and 1932, was a stimulus, as it showed that Mendelian genetics was consistent with natural selection and gradual evolution. The synthesis is still, to a large extent, the current paradigm in evolutionary biology. The modern synthesis solved difficulties and confusions caused by the specialization and poor communication between biologists in the early years of the 20th century. At its heart was the question of whether Mendelian genetics could be reconciled with gradual evolution by means of natural selection. A second issue was whether the broad-scale changes seen by paleontologists could be explained by changes seen in local populations. The synthesis included evidence from biologists, trained in genetics, who studied populations in the field and in the laboratory. These studies were crucial to evolutionary theory. The synthesis drew together ideas from several branches of biology which had become separated, particularly genetics, cytology, systematics, botany, morphology, ecology and paleontology. Julian Huxley invented the term in his 1942 book, Evolution, the Modern Synthesis. Major figures in the modern synthesis include Ronald Fisher, Theodore C. Stobzhansky, B. S. Haldane, Sewell Wright, B. Ford, Ernst Meyer, Bernhard Rensch, Sergei Chetverikov, George Gaylord Simpson, and G. Ledyard Stebbins. Summary of the Modern Synthesis the modern synthesis bridged the gap between the work of experimental geneticists and naturalists and paleontologists. It states that all evolutionary phenomena can be explained in a way consistent with known genetic mechanisms in the observational evidence of naturalists. Evolution is gradual. Small genetic changes regulated by natural selection accumulate over long periods. Discontinuities amongst species are explained as originating gradually through geographical separation and extinction. This theory contrasts with the saltation theory of William Bateson. Natural selection is by far the main mechanism of change, even slight advantages are important when continued. The object of selection is the phenotype in its surrounding environment. The role of genetic drift is equivocal. Though strongly supported initially by Dobzhansky, it was downgraded later as results from ecological genetics were obtained. Thinking in terms of populations, rather than individuals, is primary. The genetic diversity existing in natural populations is a key factor in evolution. The strength of natural selection in the wild is greater than previously expected. The effect of ecological factors such as niche occupation and the significance of barriers to gene flow are all important. In paleontology, the ability to explain historical observations by extrapolation from microevolution to macroevolution is proposed. Historical contingency means explanations at different levels may exist. Gradualism does not mean constant rate of change. The idea that speciation occurs after populations are reproductively isolated has been much debated. In plants, polyploidy must be included in any view of speciation. Formulations such as, evolution consists primarily of changes in the frequencies of alleles between one generation and another, were proposed rather, later. The traditional view is that evolutionary developmental biology played little part in the synthesis, but an account of Gavin de Beer's work by Stephen J. Gould suggests he may be an exception. Developments leading up to the synthesis, 1859-1899 Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species was successful in convincing most biologists that evolution had occurred. 
but was less successful in convincing them that natural selection was its primary mechanism. In the 19th and early 20th centuries, variations of Lamarckism, orthogenesis, and saltationism were discussed as alternatives. Also, Darwin did not offer a precise explanation of how new species arise. As part of the disagreement about whether natural selection alone was sufficient to explain speciation, George Romains coined the term Neo-Darwinism to refer to the version of evolution advocated by Alfred Russell Wallace and August Weissman with its heavy dependence on natural selection. Weissman and Wallace rejected the Lamarckian idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics, something that Darwin had not ruled out. Weissmann's idea was that the relationship between the hereditary material, which he called the germ plasm, and the rest of the body was a one-way relationship. The germ plasm formed the body, but the body did not influence the germ plasm, except indirectly in its participation in a population subject to natural selection. Weissmann was translated into English, and though he was influential, it took many years for the full significance of his work to be appreciated. Later, after the completion of the modern synthesis, the term Neo-Darwinism came to be associated with its core concept, evolution, driven by natural selection acting on variation produced by genetic mutation and genetic recombination. 1900-1915 Gregor Mendel's work was rediscovered by Hugo de Vries and Karl Correns in 1900. News of this reached William Bateson in England, who reported on the paper during a presentation to the Royal Horticultural Society in May 1900. It showed that the contributions of each parent retained their integrity rather than blending with the contribution of the other parent. This reinforced a division of thought, which was already present in the 1890s. The two schools were saltationism, favored by early Mendelians who viewed hard inheritance as incompatible with natural selection. Biometric school, led by Carl Pearson and Walter Weldon, argued vigorously against it, saying that empirical evidence indicated that variation was continuous in most organisms, not discrete as Mendelism predicted. The relevance of Mendelism to evolution was unclear and hotly debated, especially by Bateson, who opposed the biometric ideas of his former teacher Weldon. Many scientists believe the two theories substantially contradicted each other. This debate between the biometricians and the Mendelians continued for some 20 years and was only solved by the development of population genetics. Thomas Hunt Morgan began his career in genetics as a saltationist, and started out trying to demonstrate that mutations could produce new species in fruit flies. However, the experimental work at his lab with the common fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, which helped establish the link between Mendelian genetics and the chromosomal theory of inheritance demonstrated that rather than creating new species in a single step, mutations increased the genetic variation in the population. The foundation of population genetics The first step towards the synthesis was the development of population genetics. R.A. Fisher, B.S. Haldane, and Sewell Wright provided critical contributions. In 1918, Fisher produced the paper, The Correlation Between Relatives on the Supposition of Mendelian Inheritance, which showed how the continuous variation, measured by the biometricians could be the result of the action of many discrete genetic loci. In this and subsequent papers culminating in his 1930 book The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, Fisher was able to show how Mendelian genetics was contrary to the thinking of many early geneticists completely consistent with the idea of evolution driven by natural selection. During the 1920s, a series of papers by Haldane applied mathematical analysis to real-world examples of natural selection, such as the evolution of industrial melanism, in peppered moths. Haldane established that natural selection could work in the real world at a faster rate than even Fisher had assumed. 
Sewell Wright focused on combinations of genes that interacted as complexes, and the effects of inbreeding on small, relatively isolated populations, which could exhibit genetic drift. In a 1932 paper, he introduced the concept of an adaptive landscape in which phenomena such as crossbreeding and genetic drift in small populations could push them away from adaptive peaks which would in turn allow natural selection to push them towards new adaptive peaks. Wright's model would appeal to field naturalists such as Theodore C. Stobzhansky and Ernst Meyer who were becoming aware of the importance of geographical isolation in real-world populations. The work of Fisher, Haldane and Wright founded the discipline of population genetics. This is the precursor of the modern synthesis, which is an even broader coalition of ideas. One limitation of the modern synthesis version of population genetics is that it treats one gene locus at a time, neglecting genetic linkage and resulting linkage disequilibrium between loci. The modern synthesis Theodore C. Stobzhansky, a Ukrainian emigrant to the United States, who had been a postdoctoral worker in Morgan's Fruit Fly Lab, was one of the first to apply genetics to natural populations. He worked mostly with Drosophila pseudo-obscura, he says pointedly. Russia has a variety of climates from the Arctic to subtropical, exclusively laboratory workers who neither possess nor wish to have any knowledge of living beings in nature were and are in a minority, not surprisingly. There were other Russian geneticists with similar ideas, though for some time their work was known to only a few in the West. His 1937 work Genetics and the Origin of Species was a key step in bridging the gap between population geneticists and field naturalists. It presented the conclusions reached by Fisher, Haldane, and especially Wright in their highly mathematical papers in a form that was easily accessible to others. It also emphasized that real-world populations had far more genetic variability than the early population geneticists had assumed in their models, and that genetically distinct subpopulations were important. Dobzhansky argued that natural selection worked to maintain genetic diversity as well as driving change. Dobzhansky had been influenced by his exposure in the 1920s to the work of a Russian geneticist Sergei Chetverikov who had looked at the role of recessive genes in maintaining a reservoir of genetic variability in a population before his work was shut down by the rise of Lysenkoism in the Soviet Union. E.B. Ford's work complemented that of Dobzhansky. It was as a result of Ford's work, as well as his own, that Dobzhansky changed the emphasis in the third edition of his famous text from drift to selection. Ford was an experimental naturalist who wanted to test natural selection in nature. He virtually invented the field of research known as ecological genetics. His work on natural selection in wild populations of butterflies and moths was the first to show that predictions made by R. A. Fisher were correct. He was the first to describe and define genetic polymorphism, and to predict that human blood group polymorphisms might be maintained in the population by providing some protection against disease. Ernst May's key contribution to the synthesis was Systematics and the Origin of Species, published in 1942. Mayer emphasized the importance of allopatric speciation, where geographically isolated subpopulations diverge so far that reproductive isolation occurs. He was skeptical of the reality of sympatric speciation believing that geographical isolation was a prerequisite for building up intrinsic isolating mechanisms. Mayer also introduced the biological species concept that defined a species as a group of interbreeding or potentially interbreeding populations that were reproductively isolated from all other populations. Before he left Germany for the United States in 1930, Meyer had been influenced by the work of German biologist Bernhard Rentsch. In the 1920s Rentsch, who like Meyer did field work in Indonesia, analyzed the geographic distribution of polytypic species and complexes of closely related species paying particular attention to how variations 
between different populations correlated with local environmental factors such as differences in climate. In 1947, Wrench published Neura Problema der Abstammungslehre, die Transpezie Fischer Evolution. This looked at how the same evolutionary mechanisms involved in speciation might be extended to explain the origins of the differences between the higher-level taxa. His writings contributed to the rapid acceptance of the synthesis in Germany. George Gaylord Simpson was responsible for showing that the modern synthesis was compatible with paleontology in his book Tempo and Mode in Evolution, published in 1944. Simpson's work was crucial because so many paleontologists had disagreed, in some cases vigorously, with the idea that natural selection was the main mechanism of evolution. It showed that the trends of linear progression that earlier paleontologists had used as support for neolamarchism and orthogenesis did not hold up, under careful examination. Instead the fossil record was consistent with the irregular, branching, and non-directional pattern predicted by the modern synthesis. The botanist G. Ledyard Stebbins was another major contributor to the synthesis. His major work, Variation and Evolution in Plants, was published in 1950. It extended the synthesis to encompass botany including the important effects of hybridization and polyploidy in some kinds of plants. Further advances The modern evolutionary synthesis continued to be developed and refined after the initial establishment in the 1930s and 1940s. The work of W. D. Hamilton, George C. Williams, John Maynard Smith and others led to the development of a gene-centered view of evolution in the 1960s. The synthesis as it exists now has extended the scope of the Darwinian idea of natural selection to include subsequent scientific discoveries and concepts unknown to Darwin such as DNA and genetics, which allow rigorous, in many cases mathematical, analyses of phenomena such as kin selection, altruism, and speciation. In The Selfish Gene, author Richard Dawkins asserts the gene is the only true unit of selection. Others, such as Stephen Jay Gould, reject the notion that genetic entities are subject to anything other than genetic or chemical forces reasserting the centrality of the individual organism as the true unit of selection, whose specific phenotype is directly subject to evolutionary pressures. In 1972, the notion of gradualism in evolution was challenged by a theory of punctuated equilibrium put forward by Gould and Niles Eldredge, proposing evolutionary changes could occur in relatively rapid spurts when selective pressures were heightened punctuating long periods of morphological stability as well adapted organisms cope successfully in their respective environments. Discovery in the 1980s of Hox genes and regulators conserved across multiple phyletic divisions began the process of addressing basic theoretical problems relating to gradualism, incremental change, and sources of novelty in evolution. Suddenly, Evolutionary theorists could answer the charge that spontaneous random mutations should result overwhelmingly in deleterious changes to a fragile, monolithic genome. Mutations in homeobox regulation could safely, yet dramatically, alter morphology at a high level, without damaging coding for specific organs or tissues. This, in turn, provided the means to model hypothetical genomic changes expressed in the phenotypes of long extinct species, like the late Devonian fish with hands, Tiktaalik, discovered in 2004. As these discoveries suggest, the synthesis continues to undergo regular review, drawing on insights offered by both new biotechnologies and new paleontological discoveries.